Well, um, Gene, do you want to read our gospel lesson for this Sunday? Before we begin, I probably should ask, did you all get the email from Donna? Jar? Yes. 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 And I kind of decided to do something a little different this time. I thought we could kind of work through the, the parable by kind of putting another parable or story on top of it and just see how that works. And in this narrative kind of form, um, <clears throat> the gospel lesson for this Sunday uh, is, comes to us from Matthew 18, beginning with verse 21 and going through verse 35. So, Gene, if you would read that, and we'll just kind of listen in here. Should I begin? Surely. Okay. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven times. For, the reason, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all. Uh, <clears throat> I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And how might we uh, remember one another in in prayer today, and then uh, then let's let's uh, have the text speak to us again. How's Tim doing, Charlotte? Well, very very well. In fact, on Monday on Sunday. He told me that he was having a lot of pain, but he had just had surgery the day before. And um, so I called a bunch of prayer warriors I know and said, Tim needs prayer for relief of pain. And oh. Tim told me that from, from then on, from that morning until afternoon when I talked to him again, his pain just dissolved away. What a wonderful answer to Very prayer. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And he seems to be recovering well. Very good. Excellent. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, just for the family of, for Frank and Joanne Hansen and their family. Yeah, Frank passed away. I am meeting with Joanne and her daughters at one o'clock this afternoon. So I will, I will share your condolences and let them know that your prayers are unfolding them in this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My neighbor, oh, my neighbor Joan had a mass removed for her from her lung, and she's doing well. Thank you, Joan, my neighbor. 
<clears throat> and Betty had an MRI for the spot on her pancreas, and it's just fine. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as our great physician, and we thank you for the healing balm that you have brought to bear upon Kim and uh, Betty and uh, a wonderful neighbor in Jean. We thank you Tom. also for um, the special measure of your resurrecting peace that you would plant in Joanne Hansen's heart and her family as she grieves the death of her beloved husband, Frank, and bless them and, and keep them ever in your tender care. And so it is, O Lord, that we ask that you'd speak to us anew this day through your holy word, a word at the heart of it all, of your gospel, which is a word of forgiveness. Amen. Well, I want to just share with you um, an insight from a book in my library here in my office at home that I just came across last night. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the uh, New Testament theologian, um, former bishop in uh, England, um, Canterbury, whose name is N.T. Wright. And uh, this quote comes from his book entitled The Challenge of Jesus. And it was published in 1999. And so uh, Tom Wright observes, following Christ in the power of the Spirit means bringing to our world the shape of the, of the gospel. That is forgiveness. The best news that anyone can ever hear for all who yearn for it. The human race has been in exile. Exiled from the Garden of Eden, bombarded with noise instead of music, and our task is to proclaim in word and deed that the exile is over, to speak the precious Easter word of God's healing and forgiveness for all people. I thought that would set the stage well for us today because it is not only we who like this first servant who have been forgiven of a debt that we could never ever even begin to pay, which I will talk about in just a few moments, but also um, his call to uh, share this gift of forgiveness as we have been forgiven. And I think that really kind of gets to the central core of, of this parable. So let's begin with what I have as an introduction in this worksheet for us today. Um, that is to say, I think there's perhaps no greater blessing, but also a burden in life than forgiveness. Um, so let's maybe unpack that sentence just a little bit. How might we say that uh, forgiveness is a blessing, but also a burden? Good morning, Janet. Good morning. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to share out of your life and experience or observation how forgiveness has been just an incredible blessing? It's been healing. It's given you a, a new sense of freedom. <coughs> You're also quiet this morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> Yeah, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine uh, met years ago when I was in Al-Anon. Um, 
She's a recovering alcoholic of 39 years. And we had a falling out like seven years ago. And I called her last week. And she says, you know what? She's in, she's close to my age. <laughs> and she says, I went to anger management classes with all these young men. <laughs> <laughs> because she says I was angry and she she um, um, expressed her sorrow her for, you know her sorrow and I forgave her and and we're on a comfortable um, situation now it's something that doesn't sit back there in your mind that oh we had a conflict but we we kind of talked it out over the phone and it's such a relief. Mm -hmm. It was like an illness in both of us, we felt. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree with you, Audrey, I, because unforgiveness is just, it's so uncomfortable. And if, until I can forgive and get rid of the anger, mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. I suffer as much as I'm hoping the other person does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. I guess I have a... We're suffering more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I in my family, we my father and my brother were estranged for many years and and not speaking, and it was very difficult on the rest of us. So not only is it is it toxic to the parties, it's toxic to everybody who loves them and is around them, and very disruptive to family gatherings and everything. So what I'm hearing you say is, is that on the one hand, it is, it is a burden because you want the other person to go first, if you will. Right. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, as well, in the meantime, you're getting kind of eaten up by this. I had this wonderful quote from Anne Lamott in your worksheet for today that will well, we'll look at it in just in just a moment, but um, I, I I I know from experience as well as you that um, once we get to that point of receiving a word of forgiveness or even um, giving that word of forgiveness, there is like this newfound freedom that. Uh, Audrey, you were talking about mm -hmm. even if it's even if it's over the phone uh, these days, but um, boy, that that burden is there though with that anger that you mentioned. Um, it's like you want a pound of flesh as well for you know how you've been treated, um, you know, uh, kind of retribution. I so, remember. I I oh, remember Jenny. reading a book by Edna Hong called yeah. Forgiveness is a Work as Well as a Grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she went she through did. this so well. And it yeah. is work. <laughs> it's hard work indeed. Yeah. It's hard work. I yeah. have a granddaughter who <laughs> has, I have not seen since my husband died, and that was 1994. And she had an axe to grind then, and she has not kept in touch all these years. And I've tried to write and say, whatever it was, I have forgiven her, but she does not respond. So that's her burden and my sorrow. Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's something that can kind of hit us out of left field sometimes if we don't even realize it is for someone to say you know john i forgive you <laughs> you go for oh, 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 what 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 did, what did, <laughs> I, do? What did yeah. I do wrong <laughs> yeah 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 and so there are plenty of us that walk around uh wondering who are pretty sensitive um when you see somebody across a crowded room that's really angry it's kind of the height of uh, pretentiousness, though, to say, gosh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> and you don't even know who that person is. But uh, such is the way that uh, uh, we are constructed in terms of um, uh, this, this need for 
recognizing the sin that is deep seated in us that we are self centered. Yes. And um, there is deep anger there. Uh, often, when old number one feels like he or she is mistreated, and I think right now in our country with COVID, it is just rampant. I mean, just <laughs> go. Um, there's a person in this large vehicle who uh, had quite a bit of road rage coming south on Cliff and on 49th, and um, came about five feet over into my lane to try to push me over, wanted to make sure I wasn't going to sneak into the uh, bumper to bumper line of cars. And it was just, it was just unnecessary and ridiculous. And I found myself getting so angry, I just wanted to follow this vehicle and find out where this person <laughs> lived. Uh, but uh, no, I fortunately turned off on Tomar and made my way home. But uh, it is, it is, I think, um, as important to realize what underlies the need for forgiveness as much as this great gift. And that is our self-centeredness, yeah. our chronic uh, uh, sin that is there, as well as um, in these days, I think there's a lot of, a lot of anger that's being suppressed uh, in our culture. So I just give you some of these titles here to look at in terms of literature that I thought might be fun for you to look at in terms of the healing power of forgiveness. Um, in Graham Greene, as you see there, his book, The Heart of the Matter, of how um, we, with, with anger uh, and without forgiveness, um, come into almost a sense of a bipolar situation. Karen Horney was a, a great, well-known psychiatrist in New York City and her book entitled Divide Itself. Many of you I know have read John Grisham's um, Skipping Christmas, yes. when the parents get so upset at their only daughter for not coming home at Christmas time, they decide, well, we're not going to celebrate Christmas. And um, just how that churned in on them. Um, or a Chinua Chibes piece on uh, when things fall apart, or um, Terry Fredheim's recent book on um, the, 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 the fissures, the, um, the separation that we experience between humankind and, and creation in Terry Fredheim's book, as well as St. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. So here we go. Uh, good old Peter, honest, impetuous, and how wonderfully does he ask those embarrassingly blunt questions, questions that cut right to the heart of our human condition. Lord, he asks, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven? Now, Peter wasn't simply just, you know, as you're maybe thinking to yourself, pulling pulling some number out of thin air, uh, for it was the rabbinic teaching in his time with, if you look at texts like Amos 1 and 2, that God's forgiveness extends three times. And since humans can never outdo God, of course, we likewise should give others, at least in this season of baseball, three strikes and you're out. So Peter thought he was being pretty gracious here. As you see it before you, those of you who have printed it out or looking at it on, on uh, your iPad or on your computers, he took, that is Peter, the magic rabbinic number there of three, he doubles it, and then adds yet one more time for good measure, and um, comes up with seven. He must have been thinking to himself, you know, Jesus must think I'm incredibly gracious here. <laughs> but no, uh, no, uh, such is the bondage to the law. Um, in our, you know, something for something kind of utilitarian kind of culture. And so in all of his blessed bluntness, Peter speaks for all of us in the question he brought to Jesus. How often should I forgive 
my brother or sister. But Jesus knew full well how naturally it comes for us not to forgive, to want to remain in control, to, if you will, kind of marinate in it, um, in the bitterness of anger, to manipulate the guilt of another, um, as Garrison Keeler would say, that gift that keeps on giving, um, and thus to be very interested in coming to that point when God would approve of our not forgiving anymore. And so I love this quote uh, from Fred Beekner, uh, where he defines anger. And, and uh, Donna, if you don't mind, if you would read that for us here, if you have it there. I do. Okay. Of the, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick our wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback, however, is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Ouch. <laughs> how, does that, how does that speak to you today, that <laughs> sense of uh, finding that you are probably the one in the long run who's probably suffering the most from holding it all in? I'd, I'd like to think that I don't enjoy anger and relish uh -huh. it much. <laughs> Those are right. pretty relishing words. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> they are. Well, there is, a, there is a kind of a, some kind of something you get from just snarling to yourself about what they did <laughs> and how could they? And don't they know how hurtful that was? <laughs> uh, and, and, and I find that I can do that for quite a while. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why our, where I love that language of Beekner, where we just kind of marinate in the juices of the marinate, anger. Marinate, marinate yeah. anger. Yeah. But you know, if it lasts a lot of years, it's so wasted. It's such a waste. Yeah. And I, I have decided that God can handle this better than I can. And therefore, I don't hold anything against the granddaughter, but I feel sorry for her. I uh, I can't really divulge I can't really divulge what it was, but we had an incident at the church, which you can imagine happens now and then, where there was just a really petty thing that was going on, and a couple of people were really really being a bit nasty toward each other, and I was going over to visit. Uh, Frank and Joanne at hospice at Ava House. And then I was also going over to visit Dean and Jan Everts, whose daughter, Nancy, just passed away a week ago, who was, I think Nancy was only 66. Oh, gosh. And I wanted to take these two individuals with me and say, come with me to hospice. Come with me to the Everts home. And... and if, this kind of pettiness doesn't feel in comparison. And like you're saying, Janet, I mean, as the old saying has it, um, life is too short uh, for that. And so as I continue on in this narrative that I wrote out on the parable here on the top of the second page I gave you, we come to realize that Peter's suggestion of seven times is not as gracious as it might first appear, because deep down it reveals our natural inclination, each of us, to cut off at some point yeah. forgiveness. Think, for example, of such expressions. If you do it just one more time, okay, <laughs> or Charlotte kind of, after what you did, 
Okay. <laughs> after what, what after he did, let him go to, well, I can't finish it. Let's just say Sioux City. <laughs> we know. <laughs> or Omaha. <laughs> yep, fortunately, we know. <laughs> yeah. Or Buster, that's your last chance. Okay. <laughs> These ultimatums. Yep. You see, Jesus answer not seven, but 70 times seven doesn't simply lengthen the time to 490 times as the cutoff. Rather, Jesus stands Peter's question on his head. He answers Peter and all of us in such a way that the premise on which the question is asked is wrong. Forgiveness isn't some kind of mathematical formula. Forgiveness doesn't end because it has its source in God. And I love this old line from Bondage of the Will in Luther where he says, God never takes a holiday. Mm -hmm. And he can't because his, ch his children are always getting in trouble. trouble. Hmm? So, forgiveness doesn't end because we're never without debt to God. For the grace he gives us day by day. There's something about us that's chronic, that's terminal on this old bus called life. As you know, one of my favorite authors, Annie Lamott, talks about this condition. She calls it our essential unokayness. I love that. Because we're not okay. Uh, there was a book that was written by a psychotherapist that I read in my dad's office. Here. Yep, Donna knows it. <laughs> I'm okay, you're okay. And then my dad put his own twist on it and he says, I'm okay, you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> or a little, a little nicer, I'm okay, you're not okay. But um, yeah. Well, Forgiveness doesn't end because we're never without debt. We are in bondage to sin, as we say in our confessions, and cannot free ourselves. And this is why we begin each Vesper service on Saturday night or worship service on Sunday morning with the order for confession and forgiveness, um, which states we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. And so we need a Savior someone beyond us who can free us, who can set us free uh, from, from our sin and self-centeredness, from our anger, and bring it to the cross and leave it there. As Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest in Matthew 11, uh, verse 28. Martin Luther, I think, says it well there. I've given you this quote. Each day, he writes, we're in need of being reborn, of experiencing God's healing touch of forgiveness in the sacraments, in worship, in prayer, as we gather around God's holy word. And here's, here's the most important part of, I think, this, this observation of Luther. He writes, forgiveness is the greatest treasure we have to share with one another as a Christian community. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number of times as a hospital chaplain in listening to people or as a pastor with people who are feeling really, really awful. I mean, physically. And how we as human critters are, as you know, we're called psychosomatic. That means both a combination of mind and body and how they're connected. And sometimes, if people are really honest, they'll get down and say something about what has been repressed. Uh, sometimes we call it stuffing it. Charlotte, as you're kind of saying earlier. And once they can kind of get it out, they'll say all of a sudden, wow, <laughs> I feel kind of better, you know, because they they've confessed this, this, this garbage, this anger that has been deep down inside. And as Christian people, 
we have this gift as the priesthood of all believers to say, in Jesus' name, know that you are, know that you are forgiven, that God loves you as a child of God. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a lifelong process. It's day by day, as Luther says, it's being reborn each day. And so in that next section, basic point that I want to get across here is I think that we take this forgiveness, this grace of God for granted, especially for those of us who have been raised up within the womb of the church. Um, as you know, over-familiarity sometimes breeds, what do I want to say? Contempt. Contempt, <coughs> yeah. Maybe... Complacency. Complacency, thank you. Uh-huh. Taking for granted. So in this parable, the master says to this fellow who owes him an incredible debt, I release you from all, notice the word all there, your debt. It's not something that he asked for. The guy doesn't even apologize. But the master has mercy on him. And he should have carried that in himself such that with others, he would continue to express that sense of amazing grace. But no, it's kind of, yeah, okay, now I'm, now I'm debt free. Must not have been on the Dave Ramsey show. I don't know if any of you listened to it. But he missed it. The man who owed his master an unpayable sum walks right by the miracle of the master's compassion and refuses, as you heard Jean read, to forgive a fellow servant basically 20 bucks. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, as First John has it. So I want to give you something that Emil Knapp made clear to me a few years ago, how incredible this debt is. So those of you who have it in front of you, I'm going to read what Emil expressed to me, what 10,000 talents would be like if we try to repay that in terms of the amount of time it would take. So this is the way he put it with his mathematical genius. He said, think of a person putting one dollar into your hand each second. So every second you need to pay this person a dollar. Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, the distribution goes on without missing a second a day or night. How long does it take to reach $1 trillion, which is about the amount that this guy owed the master? Well, a million takes 12 days, a billion takes 32 years, and $1 trillion, which is about this amount, would take 32,000 years to pay off. That's one dollar bill. Every second, day second. after day, oh, for 32,000 years. And did you catch what this first servant says? I promise, I'll, I'll pay it in full. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. um, and my joke here is, even cats only have nine lives, <laughs> let alone 32,000. So, so I think this gets a bit, Audrey, at your point here. It's only in our bottoming out, to use AA language, when our egos finally admit we're not our own, we're not fully in control of our destiny. We realize all the hard work, the best of intentions, best efforts fall short. We realize we have and are 
um, everything comes from God's hand. Then we begin to understand this huge indebtedness that we can't ever repay. But this critical truth, this law of life, is one that we constantly try to bypass. For you see, seeking forgiveness implies an admission of our sinfulness. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and can't free ourselves. And in our psalm, I invite you to read that later today, for this coming Sunday is Psalm 103. And it says that God forgives our sin, forgets our sin, as far as the east is from the west. But how it is that we take it for granted. And so as you continue with the psalmist there, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not. So to get, get past this sense of familiarity where we become, as Donna says, complacent. We can't pay the debt we owe to God. I mean, Emil, Ma uh, Emil Knapp's mathematics, I think, shows that dramatically. The size of our sins is too great. Um, have patience with me. I'll repay you. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous when you think of it. And I think that's why Jesus sets up this hyperbole in this parable is to make the point that there's just no way that, that we can ever um, pay the debt. So um, now we witness the forgiven servant taking his fellow servant, as Gene was reading, by the throat and without wincing sends this poor fellow off to debtor's prison until the total sum of 20 bucks is paid. So why do you think that is? Why do you think this fellow who's paid, excuse me, who is um, forgiven so much, turns right around and demands that this other fellow servant pays up his beer tab? I mean, it's crazy. What's, what's going on there? I want to say he's an ungrateful wretch. <laughs> it gave him some power, I guess, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I think of greed. He's greedy. greed. He wanted the money, yeah. Mm -hmm. But how are you going to make <laughs> money in debtor, debtor's prison? How do you make money in debtor's prison? That's what I can't figure it out. There's a good story by Charles Dickens called Little Dorrit. Uh -huh. And the father in the story is sent to debtor's prison mm -hmm. because he can't pay his debts. He lives out his life in that prison. There's no way for him. How can you ever pay? Somehow yeah. he inherits money and he gets out, but then he lives the high life. He thinks he's very important. And then he dies of, after having... Uh, probably to mention, but it's a sad story of the times in the late, in the 1700s in England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're exposing something here that also gets to the total irrationality of it all. I mean, by throwing somebody in prison, how is he or she going to, to pay off the debt? Yeah. I mean, that's no. just crazy. Donna, you were going to say something there. Oh, I was just going to say the way that struck me was maybe he was going to try to not get himself into the situation of owing the master again, that he was going to try to um, collect enough from all of his debtors so that he would be able to pay, which is another irrational action yes. in yeah. this situation yes. to try to think that you can uh -huh. ever, ever do and build up enough works that you can uh, pay off your debt to God. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really tricky business when it gets into marriage, it gets into family, it gets into children, uh, among friendships, when that same kind of dynamic starts going on. That if X amount of pressure on 
this person, I can I think Donna, going back to your mm -hmm. uh, scenario about your brother and your dad, um, <laughs> other family get pulled into that as though they need to somehow pay up too. And we get caught into this, what psychotherapists call a dance. And um, it's very, very difficult to break. And it's something that's difficult that has to be faced in Al-Anon in terms of enabling or not confronting um, mm -hmm. the anger, you know, that's there. Um, then I just wanted to get at these stern words of Jesus. He, he closes the parable with stern words stating that God holds our debts against us if we forget not or forgive not our debtors. Why the sternness? Well, to begin with, I think it's because God will not have us living with hardened hearts. God will not do nothing while we walk right by his immense mercy for us, never letting, as St. Paul says in Ephesians 3, God's forgiving love in its depth and height and breadth and length really take hold of us. He will not let us get, as a physician would say, thrombosis of the soul, a hardening of the soul, as if it did us no damage. He will not tolerate the fatal bypass that is walking right by his mercy for others. And so God is stirred to the depths by the spectacle of people forgiven so incredibly much, yet refusing to be channels, or St. Francis of Assisi says, instruments of that peace, instruments that share that word of forgiveness. And I think it's difficult for us to understand. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the um, uh, Jewish rabbi whose name is Abraham Heschel. He taught at Union Seminary yes. back in the 60s. He's about four foot five. <laughs> he had a beard that was about four feet long, yes. white haired, sagely character, world renowned Jewish scholar. And he, in all of his, all of his works, his articles, his teaching, his books, there's a theme in all of them where he constantly is talking about mishpat, mishpat, mishpat. You spell it. Spell it. M i s h p a t, mishpat, mishpat, mishpat. Janet, I'm going to put you on the spot. What does mishpat mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It means justice or reconciliation. So he was giving his end of his career lecture at Union Seminary in the late 60s. One of my professor friends was there who told me the story. And the little rabbi Heschel was standing up on the front of the stage and there are, you know, hundreds of people out in the audience and this young, you know, this young buck stands up and was kind of snide, a little snarky. And he said, Rabbi Heschel, why is it you're always talking about mishpat, mishpat, mishpat? Justice, justice, justice. And Rabbi Heschel according to my professor friend who was there in graduate school at the time, stood up there for about, I don't know, 15 seconds or so, stroking his long white beard, staring up into the heavens. And he said, young man, I guess I'm so concerned about mishpat or justice because I want to lessen the suffering of God. Oh. Say that again, I want to lessen. I want to lessen the suffering of God. 
Oh, That's God. why I'm always talking about mishpat or justice. <laughs> because all the sin in the world, or in this situation, the sin of not forgiving, pains God. It hurts God. So, I don't have it right in front of me. I think it's in Isaiah 27 where the prophet Isaiah speaks on behalf of God and God saying to the people of Israel, your sin, your wickedness wears me down. It pains me. That is to say that our sin, our not forgiving, our injustice in the world pains God, that God is so connected with God's creation and with us, that the way other people are treated pains God. I, that story will always remain with me. I just think it's really powerful. It isn't some big abstraction, um, and it's not something that just speaks about our existential condition, but it, it speaks about our relationship to God that this affects, you know, God as well. Um, so I think here, here is the, the thing that really, that really ought to strike us. And that is the, the one who is telling this parable. The one who is telling this parable, Jesus himself is the one who takes upon himself the sin of the world. He takes on the full weight of it, the fullness of God's judgment for sin that we can't bear, we can't carry. If we tried, he would wipe us out. It falls rather upon Jesus himself. I have come into the world, says Jesus in John 10, 10. Why? That you might have life and have it Abundantly. Abundantly. It is Jesus himself who feels the impact of the Father's reaction to trillion dollar debtors who are being heartless toward twenty dollar debtors. Our Lord Jesus went to the cross for us. The unpayable debt was what he carried on his shoulders and the sinless life of Jesus who knew our pain, our trials, as Hebrews 4.15 says, but without sin. By his innocent suffering and death, you know this, those of you who have studied the catechism, not by silver or gold, but by his precious blood, we have been saved. So God raised Christ from the prison of the grave where all our sins held him down. The debt has been paid, the word you are forgiven, is spoken. And Jesus endorses it with his own love, signed and sealed, which is the language we use in baptism, as we are put to death with Christ, but also raised up in him in our Christian life. And so we hear the absolution at the end of the confession and absolution. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only son to die for us. And for his sake, what? God forgives us all our sins. Forgives us all our sins. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to point out that in our Lutheran tradition, uh, if anyone ever asks you, what is the gospel? The first thing I think you need to remember is that the gospel is Christ himself. Again, it's not an abstraction. It's personal. It's not propositional. And we have it right there in the beginning verse of Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. the beginning of the gospel of who? Of Jesus Christ beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing is to remember that at the heart of the gospel 
of Jesus coming into the world is his action. And here's your language, Janet. His action, according to Mrs. Fong, too, is forgiveness of sin. Oh, yeah. Sin that's free. Yep. Um, so then I want to conclude here with uh, one of my favorite stories. And I guess, Janet, I'm touched by your quoting Edna Hong and saying, uh, forgiveness is not a noun or condition. But, oh, yeah, it, I had, it, it is that. It's That's a an action. Pardon it's me? a work. Of, <clears throat> forgiveness is a yes. work as, as well as a grace. Yep, it's it's a verb as well. A word. Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> forgiveness is at the center of our Christian life. It almost it almost always comes through clearest, um, I think, for all of us when we see it in the lives of those around us or we experience it in our own lives. That is why when preaching this parable, I like to turn to people who live this truth. Um, and its power in their life. So I'm going to conclude here. One of my favorite stories um, that brings this parable to life on forgiveness for me is from a cherished mentor from my campus ministry days, and many of you know him, Dr. Mark Churstead. Many of you knew Mark. Yes. yes. And he shared an amazing story with me in his typical winsome spirit, um, about a year before he died. Um, and um, I will carry this story with me always. And here's the story that Mark shared with me. Mark's, Mark, Mark writes this to me when I'm in Montana in campus ministry myself. One evening, he says, as I was leading one of the Good Samaritan homes in Sioux Falls, I looked down the hall of the 100 wing, and there was something that just captured my curiosity. Mark says, actually, I'm just plain nosy, not curious, but I like to call it curiosity. You can almost hear him saying this. With that, I remember his thick salt and pepper beard breaking into a classic smile. And Mark continued. He said, there outside the room of a 94-year-old resident was something that fascinating. For there lived an old gentleman who was ravaged by disease. He should have died, says Mark, many months before. But somehow he couldn't. It was as though, Mark says, there was some kind of civil war that was going on inside him. His life wasn't yet complete. Something was left unfinished. He couldn't die. And all he could do was lie there, as Mark says, and suffer. I was especially curious, said Mark, grinning again, because I saw outside this room his son, who was visiting with an old nurse's aide. Now it was strange. Strange because father and son, here we go, Donna, <laughs> had a terrible falling out years before and had not spoken a word to each other for many years. I knew this, said Mark, and so I was surprised that he was even there. I couldn't hear what was going on, but from a distance, I watched an unfolding story of forgiveness and God's amazing grace. The marvelous nurse, says Mark, my favorite, said something to the son, and he looked back at her almost incredulously like, are you sure it's okay? And she smiled at him, put her arm around him, so close to her big heart that had matured with wisdom over the years. And then like a shawl, she draped that heart of her understanding over him and led him into his father's room. Well, it was none of my business, said Mark, but I was curious. So I went down to the end of the hall, leaned against the door jam, and this is what I saw. 
the light from the hall drifted into the room and captured that old son in a soft glow. He'd taken off his suit coat, folded it neatly, and placed it on the back of a chair. He then sat on the chair and took off his shoes. And then when he had them neatly placed beside the chair, he put his hands on his knees and grunted a bit as he stood up. And then Mark said, you know, when your dad is 94 years old, you're no spring chicken either. <laughs> that hit home, Pastor John? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so he pushed himself up, and I saw old son walk over to the bed of his old dad, and I saw old son crawl up into the bed of his old dad, and I saw old son wrap his arms around his old dad and heard him gently say, Dad, I'm sorry. I really do love you. And then in the silent healing balm of forgiveness, says Mark, I saw old dad become as soft and peaceful as a nursing newborn child. And I saw old dad die in peace in the arms of his old son. Yeah. Isn't that just an amazing story? Yes. That is, yeah. just, so, that is just so precious. So <laughs> what is forgiveness but a fresh new start? Giving us freedom, giving us peace fresh from God's word. Like when the women who come to Jesus' tomb on that Easter morning, heads bowed down with deep sadness, are lifted up by the voice of the angel who announces the Easter message of the gospel. Be not afraid, for you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised, he's alive and goes before you. And so each Sunday, which Luther called a little Easter, we enter again into another week of our lives, refreshed and blessed by Christ's healing, renewing, and freeing gospel word. Without doubt, we will encounter bumpy going in our new week. We will be sinned against and we'll come up short in our own words and actions toward others. So be ready for all that a new week will bring. You're forgiven. That is God's gift in Christ and is the alternative to the 32,000 year route to freedom. It's a costly gift beyond all we can think or even ask, but it's yours, completely and graciously given by Christ, pierced hands into our hands. And so take the forgiving love of our Savior into your heart that no fatal bypassing of it should occur. Yes, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Charlotte, what did you say earlier? That saved a... It saved a wretch like me. There we go. There's that word. <laughs> the old wretch. Uh. And then be in your own life the embodiment of Christ's prayer that he has taught us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Any closing thoughts or reflections? I think of one that um, where you mentioned that Rabbi Heschel. Yes. Even, even though he did not know Jesus, he knew God. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so touching that he cared enough about God. If you were ever to buy any book by Rabbi Heschel, the one that I recommend to you is entitled The Prophets. Oh, I think I Really? The Abraham prophets. Heschel. And he walks through the major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Mm -hmm and some of the minor prophets like Hosea and Micah. And um, he's an interesting fellow because on occasion he will draw in the Christian faith as well. Mm. So um, yeah, I highly commend really anything that Abraham Heschel has written. His last name is spelled H-E-S-C. 
Yeah. Abraham Heschel. Well, let's close with this prayer that Jesus has taught us that gets to the heart of things. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. God's grace to you in this new day, and we thank God for the rain that is uh, coming to these parched places of our hearts and the earth. And Donna, are you still up there on the lake? I am. We're closing up. Yeah. Uh, we've been gradually closing up since Sunday, but it's very, very cold up here. <laughs> it got down to it got down below 30 last night, and it's like 48 in, in here inside the so. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, well, I, I turned, I turned I, on the heat last yesterday. I oh, think I, there are a lot of people who reached for the thermostat yesterday. I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Donna, I'm willing to bet you have a nice, furry, cuddly, warm buddy right next to you that will keep you warm. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. There, there he is. is. <laughs> what's what's well, your puppy dog's name? Her name is Maggie May. Maggie, Maggie May. May. Yeah. <laughs> she always joins me in this spot for my Zoom Bible oh, study me. or group meetings. Nice. And even though it's colder in this room than it is in other rooms that have space heaters going. <laughs> this is my most comfortable place, but my phone, I know that my my clock is going to start bonging and I always yeah. have to get up and take my <laughs> camera away from here <laughs> so you're not listening to the phone or the um, clock. Yeah. Well, God's grace to you in this day and always and uh, in and the church, meantime, know that the park. you are forgiven oh. and that Christ's cross um, is always there for you, signed, sealed, and delivered. Take uh, care. John?